function of y and z. That's what the first step of the algorithm tells us. Now we, we, we're, going to, we're going to differentiate this respect to y. Differentiate, well, let's just say, take d dy. Take d dy. Well, this will be 0, and this will be dc dy. We are supposed to get the second component of our vector, vector field, which is 1. Because see, I wrote the, component, the second component is j, which means 1 times j. So this is should be 1. If this is 1, it means the c is equal to y plus another constant. Let's call it c1. But again, so if we were working with um, a vector field in two variables, uh, vector field on the plane, which depends only on x and y, that's where we would stop. But now we have a third variable. So a priori, this c1 could depend on the last variable, which remains, which is z. So we have to just make one more step in this algorithm. Otherwise, it looks exactly the same as before. So now we should take d dz of this. Of what? We have to assemble our... Um, what we've learned so far. What we've learned so far is that f is equal to this. But this, c, is equal to this. So that means that we can replace now this c in this formula by y plus c1 of z. And now we have to take the derivative of this whole thing with respect to z. So we find x equal to z, the derivative of this is 0, plus c1 prime of z. And we should compare it to the expression which we were given. We were given x equal to z. So that means that c prime is actually 0, which means that actually c prime is a constant. Uh, sorry, c, c1 prime. So c1 prime C1, not C1 prime. C1 prime is 0. C1 is actually a constant. It's a, it's a non-honest constant. It doesn't have any hidden dependence on anything. Okay? So the answer is... The answer is that f is nabla, nabla of the function which we found, which is x e to the z plus y plus C1, where this is actually constant. Okay? Any questions? Yes? Yes? Okay, let me switch the board. I think the derivative of... First, I have to, to reload f. This is all the information I found so far. Right. I have found that it is equal to this from the previous step, where this is already just a function of z. Because I found that c of x, this was c of, of yz, but we have found that it's y plus c1 of z. So I already put this back for the function f, right? And now I take the derivative of this respect to z, and this is what I get. Yeah? And now I have to compare it to my uh, component, the third component of my vector field, which is x e to the z. Right? On the very top row, in front of k, you have x e to the z. So I say this is equal to x e to the z. So I, I can cancel out these guys, and I end up with c1 prime is 0. That means c1 is actually constant. It actually does not depend on z. And that gives me the answer. Okay? All right. Any other questions? Okay, so this is how it works. It actually works in a very similar way. And this was all to convince you that of the importance of this uh, curl. And this is, the, this is the expression which we will use for, which we will use to establish the Stokes formula, that elusive formula which appears in the in in lower right corner. And if, you, if you think, if you, if you thought this was too much, uh, too many formulas, there's actually one more, which is called divergence. And divergence we won't need until the last lecture. But since it is uh, in this chapter of the book, I guess the idea being, let's just put it all on the table. All, the, all these derivatives that we have. And let's look at all of them at the same time. Okay? So we might as well, uh, I might as well write a formula for divergence. So divergence is also an iteration of vector fields in three-dimensional space, which we can think of as a dot product. A dot product as opposed to uh, a cross product with number. So in other words, it is dE dx plus dQ dy plus dR dz. <coughs> so it's a very interesting iteration. It takes a vector field and it spits out a function. Not a vector field, but it spits out a function. And the, the nice thing about it, so far, it's not clear what it's good for. But here's one result which, is, which might convince you that it is important, which is that if we take the, the divergence of, of a curl, so let's say we have some vector field f. Let's first apply to it curl, that is to say, cross product with number. That's what's given by this formula. So we get some expression, right? And let's take now the divergence of the result. In other words, we substitute these three components, this, this, and this, into this formula. These are not the pq and r of the original f, but these are pq and r of the, of the, of the curl. Okay? So, so you get actually double derivatives. So it looks like a really ugly expression, but actually it turns out to be zero. So that's a good thing. So this is something, this is kind of a kryptonite for a curl. That's what kills curl. So curl looks very complicated, but there is a, a nice formula which actually kill, kills curl. And now we can actually assemble all of this, all of this operations we've learned up to now. And now we can actually see that there is some system to this, that it's not random. So let me explain this. We have learned, we have learned three different operations. We have learned three different operations. The first one was the gradient. The gradient goes from functions to vector fields. You have a function f, you get a vector field nabla f. Right? That's the first operation we've learned. The second operation, which we learned today, goes from vector fields to vector fields. All in R3. All in space. And that's the curl. It takes a vector field, and it, takes, and it sends it to its curl, which maybe it's better to call it curl to kind of emphasize that it's different from this guy. Even though I really like this notation, uh, nabla cross f, but for the purpose of this diagram, maybe I'll just stick to curl to, to emphasize the difference. And now we've learned one more, which is the divergence. And divergence now goes from vector fields to functions. So you start as functions, go to vector fields, and vector fields to vector fields, and there's another operation which goes from vector fields to vector functions. So this one takes a vector field, and it maps it to divergence. Right? So three different operations. And now we've learned a very interesting aspect of this. Since you have these three different operations, you can apply two operations one after another. Right? You can start as a function, and you can apply the gradient. You get this vector field. Because it's a vector field, we can apply to it the curl. Right? And what do we get this way? Hmm? Zero. Right? This is exactly the theorem which, we, which I have formulated. In other words, if you apply this operation twice, and you take curl of nabla f, you get zero. 
this is this is this formula. Because again, curl is the same. I recall, let me maybe write it one more time. So divergence we can write like this, and curl we can also write this cross. This is just notation, the same notation, uh, two different notation, uh, choices of notation for the same thing. So you see, apply these operations one after another, and, and you get zero. But uh, zero is an error. Right. That's interesting, right? What about if we apply this one and then this one? So that means take a vector field, take its curl, and then apply the divergence. Also get zero. That's this formula right here. It's the same as writing it. We can write it like this. This is a zero without an arrow because it is a function. It's a function zero, it's not a vector zero. So you see, we have three different operations, and these operations have this property that if you apply two of them um, in sequence, you get zero. I, want, I would like to contrast that with something we discussed last time about taking boundary. You have a geometric object. You have a geometric object, like like a domain we discussed. Then we can take its boundary, right? We can take its boundary. So we just get this. And let's apply boundary one more time. Is there, is there a mistake? No, I'm sure that would be by uh, the gradient of divergence. What if you take the gradient of divergence? I see. I see. So in other words, you want to apply it like this. Yeah. Well, you, you get what's called uh, Laplacian, so it, um, I think. Um, no, Laplacian is, is the other way. Sorry. See, the point is that actually that would be like going up. That would be going from like kind of going back to the bottom to the top. And in fact, it should be, we should only be going down. So it doesn't go, it doesn't go, right? But it's a, good, it's a good idea. In a way, it's a good idea, but um, it's important here to go down. Just like a boundary. So, so, so see what I'm trying to explain now. When you, the point that I'm trying to explain is that this property, that if you, this, you have an operation which kind of goes, makes, you know, go one step. And if you take it twice, you get zero. And that I'm trying to explain is it's exactly like taking the boundary. When you take the boundary, you go in lower dimension by one. And um, you see, and if you take boundary one more time, you get nothing. So this, by the way, is another zero. This is empty. This means empty set, but for our purposes, it's like zero. Right? It's nothing. So the point is, if you think about, this is a very, this is a very intuitive concept, boundary. Right? The image of has a boundary. And then you can, then once you realize that there is such a thing as boundary, and you just start thinking about it, it's like, what is boundary of a boundary? Right? Why not? You can take a boundary, why not take boundary of a boundary? And it at first looks like a good idea, but then you realize that actually it always gives you empty set. So there's this very interesting geometric structure taking a boundary, and it has this very interesting property, which might be called new potency. It's a new potent operation. New potent meaning that if you square it, you get zero. So now you try to look for such an operation algebraically, in an algebraic world, in a world of functions and vector fields. And this is what you find. You find that there, exists, there indeed exist such operations which have the same new potent property that if you square it, if you apply it twice, you get zero. And this is a very important aspect of this formula that we're trying to establish, the formula relating. Um, Relating intervals in different dimensions because this is what I call in my you know in this driving principle this is what I call D. You see, uh, I explained already many times that the general guiding principle we are pursuing here has to do with integrating over domains and boundaries, and then here you have some, some algebraic object and its derivative. So bound so from going from left to right you take the boundary just like this, and going from right to left you take the derivative. And now here is a derivative that I'm talking about. Here I, I, lay, I lay it all on the table. If you start with a function, what you are doing um, when you're going from zero to one, you take the gradient, then you take the curl, and then you take the divergence. And this operation, D, which kind of an algebraic operation, it lives in a different world. But it turns out that, first of all, there is a, there is a trade-off between these two, which gives us this beautiful identity. And also, it has exactly the same property as B. In other words, D squared is 0, just like B squared is 0. So there is this parallel analogy between the geometric world and the end algebraic world, in which taking boundary on the geometric side corresponds to taking the derivative in this sense um, on, uh, on the other side. And this formula is just the expression of the fact that one equation is kind of dual to the, to the other. So in some sense, they are one and the same. Okay? So that's, that's what these formulas are all about. They look complicated, they look very abstract, but in fact, they're all part of a very conceptual phenomenon, very, very, very conceptual thing, and very, very important phenomenon in mathematics. And as a bonus, we can now write down, we can now write down the Maxwell equations, because Maxwell equations use, um, so this is coral, this is divergence, and now I can write down Maxwell equations, because these equations use coral divergence. So in the Maxwell equations, Maxwell equations are the equations which govern electromagnetism, which govern the behavior of electric and magnetic fields. Well, you know that there are, first of all, there are electric fields, um, for example, if you have a charge, if you have charged particles, they will. If, if they have opposite charges, they will attract. If they have the same charges, they will repel each other. Right? That's electric field. So if you, have, if you put a, if you put a charge somewhere, if you put, for example, the, um, the nucleus of, a, of an atom is a, consists of some protons and neutrons, and, and protons have positive charge, so neutrons have neutral charge, but protons have positive charge, so they all they create a field which would which would grab you know, and, and attract electrons which are negatively charged particles. So it's a very important uh, field. There's also a magnetic field. That's the field you know, that you have when you you know you have a magnet and you have a someone told me a story that they, they drop the key at night in a in a paddle and it's like what do you do? And there is a very nice solution. You take a big magnet. And you put it in the water, and boom, you got, you got the key. See? So that's magnetic field. So that's also very important. And not just for finding keys, I suppose, right? So now we look for equations which govern electric magnetic fields. And here are the equations which were written uh, in the 19th century by Maxwell, as well as other people. So the, usually the notation we choose is like this. E for electric field, and B is for magnetic field. These are just vector fields, just like the kind of vector fields which we talked about, like on that board, here's a vector field. So electric magnetic fields are just uh, vector fields like this. But they change, you know, they change in space and they also depend on time. And these equations describe the, how they depend on, on space and time. And the equations look surprisingly simple, deceptively simple, perhaps I should say. But let me, let me assume that there are no charges and currents. So it's kind of equation in a vacuum, if you will, just to simplify. Just to give you a flavor of what these equations look like. No charges or currents. So the equations just involve the, the, the divergence and the curl. So that's the first equation. See, this is the divergence of E is 0. Then you have divergence of B is 0. And then the curl of E 
is minus 1 over c dv dt, the derivative with respect to time. And the curl of b is 1 over c dE dt. Now, what is c? c is the speed of light, speed of light, which is approximately equal to 300,000 kilometers per second. So it's, very, it's very fast, but it's, it's not infinite. It's finite. So this is very important, actually. So you see, so these are the equations. Uh, you, we wouldn't be able to, understand, even understand, to read these equations, to even understand these equations, if we did not define the curl and the, and, um, and, the, and the divergence. What's perhaps more important is that these methods, this formula that we're proving now, this guiding principle, and various incarnations that we're talking about, are, by using those, we can actually derive very important consequences. For example, Gauss law, they have Ampere's law, and things like that. But if you just look at this, and it's really, uh, I think it's amazing that such complicated interaction, you know, which governs basically the entire universe, these two forces in the entire universe, can be summarized basically on half of the blackboard in this very neat and beautiful way. And just looking at this formula, you already see some very important things, which actually were, which were in some sense the cornerstones of physics of the 20th, maybe 21st and 22nd, so on centuries. The first thing you see is that this numbers, you have this number which doesn't see, the speed of light does not depend on anything. Right? It's just a constant here, which is, a, which is actually a, an incredibly powerful statement. Because in our real, in, in, kind of, in our everyday life, we are used to the fact that velocity or speed depends on who the observer is. You know, if you are, if you are standing here, and there is, a, there, is a, there is a bicycle going in this direction, right? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay? So let's say with some, with, some, with some speed, right? This is the speed which you see. But if you are going on a bicycle in this direction, or if you are walking with some speed, right? You will see, you will observe a different speed. But if you are, with the speed of light, it's not like this. The speed of light will appear in the same way to, the, to this observer and to this observer. You don't add the, the velocities one way or the other. It's a constant. This is what Maxwell's equations indicate. And this was one of the first arguments for Einstein to create his special relativity theory. He said, look, these equations work. So what they, what they show us is that the speed of light is constant in all inertial uh, coordinate systems. And that was the first, one of the first uh, steps in creating uh, special relativity. I'm telling you all this to convince you that the kind of stuff you're doing is not just a bunch of formulas that you need to memorize, but actually stuff, this stuff makes sense, and this stuff is very important. Okay? So we'll continue on, uh, on Tuesday, and uh, go Bears.